far out of town. The thing I'd miss most besides you is your food. That was a wonderful dinner. Thank you, Harry. To tell you the truth, though, I don't think Gary's missing anything in poor Charles these days since he's been in New York. <clears throat> oh, come on. You know, he's just busy with Julian Drake and his book. He's probably very anxious to get home. He didn't sound too anxious this morning when I spoke to him. Well, I kept talking about was uh, all the social parties he's been to and the important people he's been meeting. I finally had to ask him when he was planning to come home. And? Uh, he told me that he wasn't sure. He had an important meeting with Mr. Drake this morning. Well, in the meantime, you've got Dory and me to keep you from getting too lonely and depressed. Going to be seeing her later? No, she's got to work tonight. Late shift. But I'm taking her to the airport tomorrow. Oh, that's right. She's going to be spending a few days with Mark in the kingdom. Yeah. I envy that. Gina, I'm feeling very guilty just sitting ahead of my coffee, enjoying myself while you clear the table. Sit down. I'll help you clear it up later. Sorry. It's a bad old Italian habit. What can I tell you? And rude, too, I guess. No, no, at all. You're really worried about him, aren't you? Every time I've talked to him since he's been in New York, he just goes on and on about all of these promises and hopes and everything that Julian Drake is filling his head with. And I don't know what, how he can handle the disappointment if this book isn't a success. Now, Gina, look, I've known my brother a long time. And if Gary's got any talent at all, it's, it's for talking his way into a situation and coming out smelling like a rose. Yeah, well, that may be very well and good, Howard. But Gary's not a writer. He's never written anything in his life. So? He's not trying to write the great American novel. He's just writing a dire book with a twist. Nevertheless, he still has to write it. Yeah, but with the right publisher and the right editor, it could be very glossy and commercial. And that's what he really cares about. No. He cares about it being a success. And I hope it is, Gina. You know, for the first time, Gary thinks he has a way of getting all the money and fame that he's always wanted. You know something, Howard? I've never considered myself being a selfish person. But lately, I'm beginning to think that I am. Why? Because you don't share his drive and ambition? Not if it's going to change our life. Every time we talk now, all I keep saying is that how different everything is going to be. Well, I don't want it. I like it just the way it is. But Gary doesn't. Well, you think I'm right, aren't you? I am being selfish. No, no, no. Bear with me. See, I'm a lawyer. I'm, I'm always to asking questions, not answering. Ask me. Ask me questions. All right. What's the most exciting and interesting thing in your life? Besides Gary? My work at the hospital, my research project. Okay. Now, what about Gary? And what's really exciting and stimulating to him? Besides you? I don't know. It certainly isn't his pediatrics practice. I suppose writing this book. So let him write it. And pray that he gets some positive results. But it's only going to bring you closer together. Thank you. Why is it? You always know what to say to make me feel better. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but it's nice to see a smile on your face once in a while. Hail the conquering hero! <laughs> Hi, darling. Oh, Howie, you can hail me too. Yeah, hail me. <laughs> Why didn't you call and tell me you were coming home? Oh, hi, I was going to, but my fingers were so tired from signing all those contracts. Julian Drake's going to publish your book. The man's no fool. He knows a winner when he sees one. <laughs> That's incredible. Oh, I'm so happy for you. <laughs> hey. Best of luck with you. Thank you, Allie. <laughs> hey, listen, you haven't even seen the best part of it yet. Not only did one of the largest publishing houses in New York sign me up, but they gave me a little advance to write it. A little advance against my royalties. <laughs> and a fairly tidy sum, I understand. All right, so, so, Gary, did you say you already signed the contract? With indelible ink, yeah. Howie. But maybe you ought to let me look over them to make sure you protect them. Hey, thanks, but no thanks. Actually, I've got something better in mind for you. You know what I'd like you to do? Just call my office first thing tomorrow morning and 
can't sell my half of the practice to my partner. Wait a minute. Don't you think you're rushing things a little bit? Yeah, yeah supporting authors have uh, deadlines to keep, you know? And uh, or else I'd take care of it myself. No, I'm going to trust you to look after my better interests. Well, then listen to me. Don't sell your practice. Hire a doctor to take your place while you write the book. But that way, at some future date, you want to go back into pediatrics. It's going to be there waiting for you. Okay, I listen to you, now you listen to me. On the way back, on the plane, I came to a decision. I am trading in the old stethoscope and tongue depressor for a typewriter and paper for good. End of discussion. Gary, I think Howard is right. Of course you do. You have an established practice. Which I hate, and which I want out of. Okay, fine, you hate it, but look, if you do what Howard says, they should always have something to fall back on. Gee, I'm not going to need anything to fall back on. I am writing a book. Julian Drake is going to publish it. Because whether you want to believe this or not, he happens to think I'm a winner. Gary, look, I'm not saying I don't believe in you. Honey, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it to sound like I'm sorry. It's just I'm going to need all the support I can get out of you for the next few months. Okay? And you, brother, I mean it. Seriously, first thing tomorrow morning, let's get that ball rolling. Now, Gary, look, I know you don't want to listen to me. Don't you think you'll take a couple of days just to talk things over with Gina? I don't have a couple of days, Howie. Drake didn't give me that advance to sit around and talk about things. He gave it to me to write. I got a phone call to make. Uh, have you eaten anything? I, we've just finished, but I can heat up something. No, no, I'm going to see if Tracy maybe want to come over and celebrate with us, huh? Oh, is that who you're calling? Who else? Without that lady and her encouragement, I'd probably be stuck giving booster shots to those runny-nosed little rugrats for the rest of my life. Hey, what's with you two? Come on. This is probably one of the most exciting evenings of my life, huh? Let's get a little merriment. Have a little celebration. Come on. Sorry. I guess I was just in shock a little bit. Everything's happening so fast. <laughs> you just hang on, darling, because it's going to be one big merry-go-round from here on. You know, I think, first of all, I'd get you a nice floor-length mink coat. I mean, it gets cold up here. Yes. Yes, this is Gary Lansing. Could I have Tracy Quartermain, sweet, please? It's a way to like tell her. You probably hear her yelp all the way over there. If the tow truck gets here before Leslie and Rick, I I'd better stay so that they don't think that we left. Well, Laura, the guy at the gas station said the, the truck was out on a call and he didn't know how long it was going to take. Laura, well, your parents will be along pretty soon. I, I told Leslie not to leave Monica's party with him. She insisted. Yeah, I hate to see him make that trip, too. But if we can't get the car started, we would have had to call somebody to pick us up anyway. You still cold? I'm freezing. I, I don't think I dressed warmly enough. Well, how did you know that we were going to have to take a two-mile walk? Listen, how about some coffee, all right? I'll tell the manager that we'll be in the dining room, all right? No, thank you. Scotty, what's going to happen to me when Mr. Higgins finds out that I missed my curfew and he has to write another bad report to Judge Stallman? Another? No, Laura, if you're talking about that fight you had with Bobby in the book room, Higgins didn't have to make a bad report. He wrote the facts. And when Judge Salman reads it, he could think that I have a violent streak in me that I can't control, just like the night I killed David. Laura, Laura, now listen. He spoke to Bobby. He spoke to me and he spoke to your parents. And he knows that you two haven't been getting along for a long time. But not getting along doesn't mean that you hit someone. Laura, now come on. Now don't let your mind go crazy with these ideas, okay? Please. I can't help it, Scotty. Because even if I do exactly what the court says for the next four and a half months, I still might be sent to a farm school. Laura, no, you're not. Now, the judge released you in the custody of your parents. Laura, that is where you're going to stay. Not if something happens to their marriage. And then they separate. Now, Judge Stallman is never going to let me live with Leslie. Not after all the lies she told under oath to protect me. Laura, Laura, come on. Now, listen, I know you're upset about missing your curfew, but it's just going to make it worse, letting your imagination run wild like this. The problems between Leslie and Rick are very real, Scotty. And then they could separate. And then what? Laura, then I would be there with you. 
I am not gonna let you send me away to reform school. All right? How? I don't know, Laura, but I will find a way. Honey, we're here. Oh, honey. Laura, everything's gonna be all right now. I know it is, Dad. Now that you're here. Thank you very much, Colin. Please tell the chef it was wonderful. Oh, Monica, I should hate you for ordering everything back for this dinner tonight, but it don't. It was marvelous. Well, you hardly have a weight problem, Dr. Adamson. It's all those second helpings you kept offering everyone. Well, I wouldn't have been able to if Rick and Leslie had stayed. However, it's a habit I've carried with me since the orphanage. I hate to see good food go to waste. Good for you. You know, for the first time since I've been following the Weber case, I think I finally understand everything. You're a little late, Tracy. The case is closed. I know that. However, one thing I could never fathom was Leslie's obsession with her daughter. But tonight, I saw it before my own very eyes. Tracy, the court made Leslie and Rick custodians for Laura until Judge Storman makes his decision. You know, if I were Laura's mother, I'd be very concerned about her, too. Concerned? Yes. But would you be willing to perjure yourself in court, knowing you were jeopardizing your career, your family, your whole life? Tracy, I think Leslie's the only one who can really answer that question. But why? Me, I'm a parent. You're a parent. We both know how we'd react in the same situation. No, no, we wouldn't. Laura and Leslie's relationship is somewhat different than most. How? Leslie didn't bring Laura up. In fact, she thought Laura had died shortly after she was born. It's only a few years ago she discovered that Laura was living with some people that Laura thought were her parents up in Canada. The day she gave her statement in Judge Windsor's chambers, Dr. Weber told about how she found Laura and uprooted her from that family. I think she carried around a lot of guilt for bringing Laura here to live with her. Well, that's fine, but that still doesn't explain why Gentlemen, a woman would put herself... I thank you for trying to placate my sister. Maternal devotion is something that she'll never understand. That may well be, Alan. And if that's the way that Leslie feels about Laura, that's fine with me. But what about Rick? He certainly got lost in the shuffle, didn't he? Rick is not lost, Tracy. He loves Leslie and Laura very much. That's right, Tracy. He adopted Laura as his own daughter. That means he is very happy with his family and his life. Is or was, Monica? You cannot sit there and tell me that that man would adopt Laura now, after her notorious affair with David Hamilton and his death. Why, it almost cost him his job. Oh, my God, Tracy. You sound like a broken record. Haven't you twisted the knife enough tonight? Have I? With Leslie. Or are you so insensitive right, that the people's... Ladies, I think that's enough. Well, I'm sorry. It seems that every time I try to make polite conversation, I say the wrong thing. I think I'll rectify that and leave. My mother always taught me that it was uh, not a good idea to be the last one to leave because people thought you were desperate and unwanted. Mitch? Uh, good night. Good night. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Monica. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening, Mitch. We will, Alan. We'll have our nightcap downstairs in my hotel suite, where I don't get reprimanded for every little thing that I say. Good night. Lovely dinner party, Monica. Thank you again, Alan. You talk to Rick, tell him we'll straighten everything out with Higgins tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Your sister is impossible. She's more than that. She's trouble. But at least tonight, she didn't draw blood. Oh! Didn't you see Leslie's face when she just happened to mention Rick being head of the cardiac wing? You hardly miss it. You know, it is difficult enough for Leslie to have to come to the hospital every day and try to get her life back in normal without coming to a party with her friends and then have to be reminded of the whole thing all over again. Yeah, I wouldn't let it upset me now. I'm sure Leslie has so much on her mind tonight with Laura and Scotty stuck up at the lodge that and she won't give Tracy's question another thought. Well, oh, maybe. I just wish Rick would call. Now, tell us what's going on up at that lodge. 